uh, they couldn't be on it. Okay. Okay, are we ready? We are ready. Great. Yeah, I think so. All right, so good evening to everyone. And uh, first and foremost, wishing everyone a Shana Tova, a Ktiva V'chatima Tova after the year we're about to finish. We all need it more than ever. And Be'ezrat Hashem, it should be uh, a safe and a substantial Yamim Tovim upcoming. So all thank right. God this year we have a very unique structure of the Yomim Tovim. It's happened before, but it hasn't happened in the last few years. And therefore, I thought it might be uh, a good idea to refresh a few things that are very unique for this year only. Namely, this particular year with the three-day Yontiv starting us out, Yom Kippur on Shabbos has a few unique halachot, which I thought might be important and germane to go over as we get closer to it, Be'ezrat Hashem, in a week's time. So I'm not going to deal with the regular halachot of Yantiv and of Shabbos, because I'm sure you all know them from past years, but rather the unique ones for this particular year. And I've identified nine topics that I think are germane this particular year, and very slowly let's go through them and see what they are. And I'd like to go in chronological order, not in order of importance, but rather chronological order. So let's begin with this coming Motzei Shabbos. This coming Motzei Shabbos is the first Slichot for Ashkenazim. I believe everyone I've seen on this Zoom so far are Ashkenazim. So we have the shortest possible Slichot in any structure of whenever Rosh Hashanah comes out. You need a minimum of four days before Rosh Hashanah, and we have four days this year. No more and no less, but rather four days. From this perspective, I'd like to encourage everyone, if they can, to try to say slichot on time. What's on time? First of all, the best time to say slichot is, of course, from midnight until sunrise. That's the best time to say slichot. The second best time is during the day. The worst time is between Tzaita Kochavim, whenever the stars come out, around 7 o'clock nowadays, till midnight. So because there are the years where there's so many days of Slichot, obviously there maybe is room to be Mekel because everything's based on Kabbalah at the end of the day. But this Kabbalah happens to be Paskind in the Shulchan Aruch. And therefore, since this year it's the shortest possible Slichot before Rosh Hashanah, I encourage everyone to try to say Slichot as much as possible on time. Chatzot, midnight until sunrise, the best time, second best during the day, and try to stay away from till midnight. That's the first issue. So that's Saturday night going into Wednesday. Now we get to Wednesday. Wednesday is going to be Erev Yontiv, and that's the second topic I'd like to bring up. Erev Yontiv for three days. Thursday, Friday, Yontiv, and then eventually Shabbos. There's three things I think we have to remember on Wednesday. Number one, first and foremost, not to forget to do an Eruv Tafshilin, to take something cooked and something baked. It could be a piece of bread and an egg or anything of that sort, and to do the Eruv Tafshilin. Make sure to make to put the Eruv Tafshilin in a place where you are not going to eat it before Shabbos. If God forbid you do eat it before Shabbos, then you cannot make preparations for Shabbos on Friday. So make sure to put it in a bag and say, do not eat until Shabbos. Once Shabbos comes in, you can eat it and there's no problem. But it has to be in existence up until Shabbos. So we, we, we don't have one of these things where the community rabbi makes one just in case. 
The community rabbi does make one just in case, but I remind everyone of two things. Number one, there is no rabbi of the city here in Efrat. So therefore, I don't think anyone is making an Eruv Tafshilin. The last time it happened, I checked with rabbis and no one thought it was their job to do. So number two, even if they wanted to do it, it's a little questionable if it would work because there's no formal rabbi of Efrat and therefore for to, re to rely on them would be questionable. In any case, you should know that any rabbi that's doing Eruv Tafshilin usually says in all the members of my community and have them obviously in mind. However, I would not rely on that because it's very questionable halachically. I would try to the best of my ability to do an Eruv Tafshilin. So you can do it any time on Wednesday. So my advice is as early as possible to do an Eruv Tafshilin, make the bracha, say the words. By the way, you could be in any language, meaning the bracha has to be in Hebrew, but the words afterwards does not have to be in Aramaic. It could be in regular Hebrew. So make sure to make an Eruv Tafshilin and don't eat it until Shabbos. That's the first thing that's important on Wednesday. Number two, make sure you buy, in my humble opinion, a 72-hour candle for the three-day Yontif. I know they sell 48-hour candles, but I found them to be not exactly 48 hours. So you may get stuck when you want to light Shabbos candles on Friday. From this perspective, my advice is to buy a 72-hour candle so that you'll be able to transfer fire if you need to cook on the first two days of Rosh Hashanah. And, of course, to light candles on Thursday night and Friday night. Number three. In this booklet that came out here in our city of Efrat with the halachot of this year, does everyone see it? All right. Make a long story short, there is a booklet that came out in Efrat. It's in many shuls. It says, Ma'amarim v'halachot le'yareach e'ha'itanim tafshin pe'hei. And there happens to be a few mistakes in there that I alerted the Mo'atzad Atit about. I haven't seen them correct them yet, but one of the mistakes is in terms of the bracha you make on candles. You know, sometimes when you have a list of halachot, all you do is take last year's and you copy it for this year. So that's what I think happened over here. And therefore it says that on the first night of Yontiv, you should say, Lahatlik near shel Shabbat v'shel Yom Tov. Obviously that's a mistake. Wednesday night and Thursday night is not Shabbos. You lay, make the bracha lahatlik ner shel yom tov. And shehechiyanu, if your practice, the one lighting candles, is to make a shehechiyanu when you light candles, if you don't want to wait till Kiddush. I also want to remind everyone of another issue, and that is not to shut off the fire on yontiv. In other words, it's a three-day yontiv. You may put on your gas to cook something, which is 100% fine, but you're not allowed to shut it off. So unless you have a chagaz from a chon tzomet or some other way to shut it off that's permissible, you're not allowed to shut it off. So just remember, you can transfer fire from an existing flame, but you cannot shut it off. Moving on, so that's Wednesday. So just to reiterate, Wednesday, make an Eruv Tafshilin. Number two, 72 hour candle. And number three, remember the bracha is lahadlik ner shel Yom Tov and not Ladlik Ner Shel Shabbat for Wednesday night and Thursday night together with the Shechianu. Again, if that's your practice to say a Shechianu when you light candles. If not, you can wait till Kiddush and you don't have to make the Shechianu. On Friday night, obviously, when you light candles, we'll get there in a moment. You're going to say Ladlik Ner Shel Shabbat, which leads me to the next thing. So we mentioned Wednesday before Yantiv. Now we get to Wednesday night. So Yontif began. Everyone, Baruch Hashem, got through the preparations of Wednesday. I believe that this year, especially, when you eat the Simonim on the first night of Rosh Hashanah, or whoever has the practice on the second night as well, I believe we have to add Simonim that have to do with our situation this year. Simonim is a very ancient, ancient minha going back all the way to the Gemara. And therefore, I think it should definitely get the importance it deserves. So I'm going to send right now in the chat uh, a beautiful, beautiful idea.
for how to do the simonim this year, just to add words that have to do with our situation. The one that uh, authored it was Rav Yatz Rimon from uh, Alon Shvut. And I think that uh, in many, many different ways, it's very germane and very nice to use this year as your simonim, especially with everything that's happening. So I just put that in the chat. Whoever would like a copy afterwards is welcome, of course, to uh, let me know. So we got to Wednesday night. The simonim, again, should be something that should be, in my opinion, germane. So, so no year. new simonim. You can add as many simonim as you would like. In this particular pamphlet that I just sent, there's the regular simonim, but with added words. But you can add as many simonim as you would like. It's a beautiful minhag. And I think that, uh, especially this year, we should be creative, not just say what it says in the machzer. When we say, she kartu soneinu, when you eat karti, or uh, et cetera, you shouldn't just talk about soneinu in an amorphic term. You should mention what you mean, especially this year. Okay, so Wednesday night, we do the simonim. I want to also remind everyone a second thing about Wednesday night, about Thursday morning and Thursday afternoon. Even though we did an Eruv Tavshilin, there is no heter to make preparations for Shabbos on Thursday. The Eruv Tavshilin only allows preparations for Shabbos on Friday, on the second day of Yantiv. So on Thursday, if davening happens to end early and you have a little free time, that is not the time to start preparing for Shabbos. It's actually forbidden. You can only prepare on Wednesday night, Thursday morning, Thursday afternoon, up until Tzayta Kochavim on Thursday for what you need on Thursday. You can cook lunch, you can cook an early dinner, but you cannot, I repeat, you cannot make preparations for Shabbos on Thursday, only on Friday. Just to give a practical example of what I mean, not from the kitchen, outside the kitchen. Some people do not have the practice of folding their talis on Shabbos because it's preparation for after Shabbos. So they leave it unfolded. So Thursday after the first day Rosh Hashanah davening, you're not allowed to fold your talis for Friday. But Friday after Rosh Hashanah davening of the second day, you can fold your Shabbos toward your talis towards Shabbos because you did an Eruv Tafshilin. So once again, Wednesday night, Thursday morning, and the whole day Thursday up until Tzayta Kochavim, Anything you want to do for Thursday is great. Anything for Friday or for Shabbos is forbidden. The third issue I wanted to uh, bring up in this regard after talking about Eruv Tafshilin and the Simanim is showering on Yantiv. I'm sure many of you have different opinions on this, so I'm going to give my honest-to-goodness opinion, and I'm sure that uh, out there you'll find 20 more opinions on showering on Yantiv. The reason I'm bringing it up is because it's a three-day Yantiv. I believe everyone on this chat takes a shower at least once a day. And therefore, today, it's a davar hashaveh lechol nefesh. It's not like in once upon a time where you took a bath once a week. Today, we take showers every single day. And therefore, on the three-day Yantiv, not Shabbos, but on Thursday and on Friday, this is what I personally poskin for people. A, if you have a dut shemesh, you can take a normal shower if the water's coming from your dut shemesh, from your dut shemesh on the roof. Number two, if you don't have a dut shemesh and you have a boiler, but the boiler is off, it was shut off before yantiv, then you could take a shower, but you can't wash your entire body at once. You should use not the shower coming from the ceiling, but rather the uh, hand spritzer, for lack of a better term, and you can wash yourself, but you can wash yourself, obviously, not your whole body at once. If, on the other hand, it's not the Duchemesh, and the boiler is on, then only if you're mitzta'er harbei, as Rabbi Akiva Eager says, only if you really feel sweaty and whatnot, if the weather's very hot, then and only then you can take a shower with the spritzer. And then I would suggest to use lukewarm water and not hot water. So once again, duchemish normal. If the boiler, no duchemish, but the boiler's off, then the spritzer. And if the boiler's on, then obviously 
lukewarm water and only the spritzer as well. That's what I poskin for people. I'm sure there's other opinions out there, but I believe that even if your practice was not to take showers on Yuntiv, on a three-day Yuntiv, I think, especially Friday in honor of Shabbos, this should be done. Now, the showering guidelines is only for Yuntiv. It's not for Shabbos. On Shabbos is something called Gzerat Balanim, which changes things. So therefore, I'm just talking about Yuntiv. I also, of course, warn everyone, even though it's obvious you can't put on the boiler on Yuntiv, obviously. And when you take shampoo, make sure that if it's long hair, you do not rub it in because you can tear out hairs very easily. Obviously not to comb your hair after a shower. Be very careful with all the regular halachot of Shabbos and Yuntiv. And therefore, you can definitely wash yourself, but be very careful not to do anything to rip hairs out or whatnot, because that's obviously an iser da oraisa on Yuntiv as well as it is on Shabbos. And obviously, only liquid soap, not a bar of soap. So just to reiterate what we did so far, we spoke about Slichot this year, Wednesday to prepare an Eruv Tavshil and a 72-hour candle, and of course, to make the proper brachot when you light candles. The simonim should be a little different this year, in my humble opinion, and do not prepare for Shabbos on Thursday, on Wednesday night, Thursday only on Friday, mainly Thursday night after Tzayt HaKochavim into Friday. And we just mentioned the showering on Yontif. And what, what about drying off after the shower? I don't see any problem with drying off. In the normal way? The normal way. If indeed your hair is very wet and you have long hair and you're going to take the towel and go like this, you may rip out hair. So I wouldn't suggest doing that. But I don't see a problem with uh, drying off. Right. You don't get the schita by drying off. Yeah, that's surprising because <laughs> it, uh, until... Uh, 30 seconds ago, I thought that was one of the big issues of not only the shower, but uh, even jumping into a swim uh, to cool off or whatever it is, uh, you know, on Chabas or, or, or Yantav. Uh, so uh, I always thought that was a big, big issue, the drying it off. Could be a very big issue if uh, indeed you go into a pool with a bathing suit. That could be an issue of schita, uh, of wringing out something. But uh, obviously, that's not in a shower. We don't go in with a bathing suit. But it's interesting that many people, when, when it comes to pools, it's a whole different issue. And are you allowed to on Shabbos if it's cold and uh, a pool versus uh, a lake? It's a big issue. But one of the issues, as you pointed out, is can you wring out that bathing suit by going in and out of the pool? So that's an issue. Some are matir, some are mekel, some are machmir. Obviously, in the shower, that's not an issue. When you get out of the shower... And you're just drying yourself off. You don't get to that same level as you do when you jump into a pool with a bathing suit. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> I'm just going to right. point out as a commercial oh, question. Yeah. No, I was just saying great. I mean, I, I, that's okay. I thought someone had a question. Uh, I just want to point out uh, as a commercial break that uh, I sent all these corrections to the Moatza Datit. I hope they'll uh, make them known, but on page 20 of this pamphlet, it says that if you uh, missed Kia Chofar in Shul, you should try to blow 100 kolot. I don't know what that's based on. I think that's a 100% mistake for two reasons. Number one, we only blow, blow mea kolot because we're going to blow in the Amida, namely in the Chazar Atashat, so we already got the 60, and we make up to 100. If you're not going to blow in the uh, Chazar Atashats, then you're not even get close to 100, and there's no minhag to make up 100 kolo. If you cannot get to shul for some reason, and someone comes over to blow shofar for you, or you blow yourself, you blow 30 kolo, namely, tekiah shvarim trua tekiah three times, tekiah shvarim tekiah three times, and tekiah trua tekiah three times. What we do before Musaf even in shul. That's it. Number two, there's an iser on Yontiv of playing musical instruments. So outside of fulfilling the mitzvah, you're not allowed to blow shofar for kicks. Little kids under bar mitzvah are allowed to. Lehit lamei, to mechanech. But people above bar mitzvah, but mitzvah, are not allowed to pass the mitzvah. So from this perspective, 
very important not to blow a hundred kolot outside of shul. Only so once again in shul we blow a hundred kolot. If you did not make it to shul, it's thirty kolot. The bracha as in the machzer with the shechianu and what it says there before musaf. That's all that's allowed. If not, it could be an iser of blowing musical instruments on Yantiv. So I just point that out as a commercial break, nothing to do with this year particularly, but since we're going in order, I thought I'd mention that. Um, as a side issue, if anyone needs to go to Mikveh on one of the days of Rosh Hashanah, the mass preparations should be done on Erev Rosh Hashanah as much as possible. And of course on Rosh Hashanah within the guidelines I mentioned regarding showers. Now we got to Friday. So we finished the first day of Rosh Hashanah. We got to Friday itself. On Friday, I want to advise everyone to finish all your Shabbos preparations about an hour before Shkia. Shkia on Friday is going to be here in Ephrat at 624. The reason for that is a little bit lumdish. I'm going to make it very, very clear. How does Eruf Tafshilin work? One of the Deo, named Rav Chisda in the Gemara, says as follows. Essentially, you're not allowed to prepare from Friday to Shabbos. Yantiv does not prepare for Shabbos. However, we have a heter on Yantiv. And the heter is, yet you're allowed to prepare food after you finish lunch on Friday, just in case a guest will walk in. So after you finish lunch on Friday, according to Rav Chizda, you would not be able to prepare a chulent for Shabbos, but you can prepare a chulent on Friday just in case a guest comes in. Now that heter we don't paskin like. However, we use it and utilize it with an Eruf Tafshilin. That heter only works if there's a probable probability or a option that a guest will walk in. That will not happen two minutes before Shkia. That won't happen so close to Shabbos on Friday. That will only happen during the day. And therefore, there was an ancient minhag brought in the Mugin Avraham and others to make an early Shabbos on a Friday if it's a yuntif, so that all the preparations would be done at least an hour before Shkia. So therefore, I advise everyone to be machmir for this point of view. And therefore, all your Shabbos preparations of sorts, shapes, and sizes should be done by an hour before Shkia on Friday. That means, for example, the chulent is up. That means the soup is on the plata already and warm, warm enough that people can eat it. So all of that should be done at least an hour before Shkia. So if Shkia is at 624, by 530 plus minus, all the preparations for Shabbos should be done. On that note, I was actually asked by someone in the community about making a chulent in a crock pot on this three-day yontif. So my suggestion, just practical, is as follows. And this has to do with Shabbos clocks in general. You cannot make a Shabbos clock go on earlier than you set it before yontif. So if case scenario, you set your lights for one o'clock, you can't have it go on at 12 o'clock. However, if the lights are going to be on from 1 to 5, you can enlarge that, continue the existing situation to whatever time you'd like. You can push down the little things on the Shabbos clock. Therefore, my advice with regard to the crock pot, if you make a chillant in a crock pot, is as follows. On Wednesday before Yuntiv, plug in the crock pot, put in water in the pot so it doesn't burn, and set it to go on, say, Thursday afternoon and Friday afternoon from, I don't know, 1 to 5. And on Friday, what you'll do is you'll enlarge that for as much time as you need into Shabbos. So instead from 1 to 5 on Friday, you'll make it go till 12 o'clock the next day. That's 100% mutter on Shabbos as well as in Yontiv. And that's the way you can use your crock pot. Was I clear? Or should I demonstrate? Seems clear to me. Okay. I have a Shabbos clock right next to me, so I can always demonstrate. So if and you want to let, let the, the, if anybody wants a demonstration, let the rub know. Please, with pleasure. So that's the way I would suggest to use the crock pot. 
And again, any lights in the house, if you want the lights Friday night to go on for longer, that's not a problem. If your kids are going to hang out Friday night, but they're not hanging out Wednesday and Thursday night. So no problem on Friday via the Eruf Tavshilin to go to your Shabbos clock. And if the lights are supposed to go off at 10, to let it go off at 1. That's not a problem. You can't put it on earlier, but you can again enlarge, continue an existing situation. Great. Now we get to Friday night. Friday night, we're going to daven a short Kabbalat Shabbat because we're going from Yom Tiv to Shabbos. Everybody knows that. But once we finish that transition period and we get home and it's already dark, it's no longer Yom Tiv. Therefore, the machlokas you find, the Yisink Shalom Aleichem Eshet Chayel on a Shabbos Cholomoed does not apply on the three-day Yom Tiv on Friday night. Because Friday night is a normal Friday night. So if your practice every Friday night is to sing Shalom Aleichem and Eshet Chayil and bless your children, it would be no different on Shabbos Shuva night, Friday night after the two-day Yontif. The only difference is the transition period. But once the transition period is over, it's a normal Friday night, regular Kiddush Friday night, everything the same. So that's with regard to Friday night. Shabbos Shuva will be Shabbos Shuva. And finally, we get to Sunday. Sunday will be Tzom Gedalia Nitche. Why is that important? On a regular Tzom Gedalia, the people that are exempt from fasting are anyone that's a Chole She'en Bo Sakana and up. Namely, if you're in bed and you're sick. In other words, you would call in the office and say, I'm sick, I have to call in sick, that's enough to exempt you from a fast of Tzom Gedalia, of Tisha B'Av even, as well as Yud Zayin B'Tamuz and Asara B'Tavis. However, when the fast is Nidche, like it is this year, we're supposed to fast on the day after Rosh Hashanah, but that's Shabbos, so we're pushing it off to Sunday, we go down another notch, and therefore anyone that has any ailment Namely, they're not sick in bed, but let's say they have a bad cold and they can function with tissues, with uh, Dexamol. They would be exempt from the fast this year because it's a nitche. If you have a terrible headache and you take a pill and, you know, it's not comfortable, but you're able to function, then, again, you would be exempt from the fast this year because it's a nitche. Just to illustrate my point, on a regular Tzom Gedalia, if there's a bris, so, the everyone fasts, there's no exemption from the fast. Who drinks the wine? The mother of the baby, because the mother of the baby is a chola she'en basakana. She's very close to the time she gave birth, and she drinks the wine. However, on a nitche, it could very well be, it not could very well be, it is the halacha, that the father of the baby, the sandik, and the mohel are exempt from fasting. So that's just a little note about Sunday. So if after your three-day yantiv you have a bad cold, you would be exempt from fasting on Sunday, Tzom Gedalia. Not on a regular year, but only on this year. That's with regard to Sunday. So Monday through Friday of the, excuse me, of the Aseret Yemei Tshuva are the regular Aseret Yemei Tshuva like every year. And now we got the Friday. Erev Yom Kippur. Friday is also Erev Shabbos. So I want to just say a few things about this because I think it's important. A, if Yom Kippur is also Shabbos, outside of eating and drinking, it has all the halachos of Shabbos and of Erev Shabbos. So if on every Friday you do certain preparations for Shabbos, it would be the same if Yom Kippur comes out on Friday. The only difference would be that on a regular Friday, you should curtail your eating so you'll have a good appetite for the evening. Obviously, on Erev Yom Kippur, which is a Friday, there's a mitzvah to eat, and you don't have to curtail your eating. But outside of that, if you clean your house on Friday in honor of Shabbos, you should do so on Erev Yom Kippur, which is a Shabbos. It's a double whammy. It's a Shabbat Shabbaton that falls out on Shabbos. So all your regular preparations, whatever you do, you put a white tablecloth on the table, that should be done even if Yom Kippur comes out on Shabbos. 
obviously within reason. But everything that you usually do in honor of Shabbos, Lechvot Shabbos, should be done on Friday, Erev Yom Kippur. A little second issue that's a small issue. One of the known parts of davening is Avinu Malkeinu. And everybody remembers at the beginning of the war, many of us said it every single day. Some of us even on Shabbos. The Minog, I would say for the last uh, six, seven, eight months, outside of my office in Lod, there's a beautiful minion of all the offices around. And uh, it's beautiful to see. Gerach Hasidim and Svardim and Ashkenazim all come from Mincha. And they still say Avinu Malkeinu to this moment. But outside of them, I haven't heard in any other shul that they say Avinu Malkeinu anymore. So from this perspective, I want to say that since we're going to omit Avinu Malkeinu on Friday night, Kol Nidri night, as well as Shachris, and only say it by Ne'ila, the custom is, as brought in the Ramah, that you do say Avinu Malkeinu on Friday morning. So usually on an Erev Yom Kippur, there's no Avinu Malkeinu, but this year there will be Avinu Malkeinu on Erev Yom Kippur in the morning. That's what the Ramah paskins. Not by Mincha, but in the morning. That's what the Ramah paskins. Third issue. As we get closer to Yom Kippur, I mentioned you omit Avinu Malkeinu, when it comes to the Yud Gimel Mido, the 13 attributes of mercy that you say when you take out the Torah, that we usually omit on a Shabbos, there's a machlokis if you omit it, if a Shabbos and Yom Kippur coincide. So if a Chazan says it, I would not hush him. But I would say that if the Chazan asks, the answer is we don't say it on Yom Kippur, Shechaliot, B'Shabbos. But if he does say it, you should know he has ample ground to rely on. So Yom Kippur falls out on Shabbos, which leads to the following halacha. There's a big machlokas if someone has to eat on Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, as you know, the stakes go up, and there has to be a choleshi yeshbo sakana, someone in a life-endangering situation. So if that person is permitted to eat, then the question is, should that person say Kiddush first? After all, Yom Kippur is a yuntiv, and therefore maybe she should say Kiddush, or he should say she Kiddush. The answer is, the Chachamim were never metakin Kiddush for Yom Kippur. But what happens if Yom Kippur pulls out on Shabbos? So they're eating, it's a Shabbos, should they make Kiddush first? Maybe just the Kiddush for Shabbos. That happens to be a very big machlokas. Lahalacha I don't know any posek that says to make Kiddush on Yom Kippur, even if it falls out on Shabbos. But, here comes the but, for all of us. Because we may all have a mitzvah to say Kiddush on Shabbos, in davening, Friday night, or if you forgot, Shabbos morning, or by Musaf, Shabbos morning, or by Mincha. When you say the words, You should have in mind that you are fulfilling the mitzvah of Kiddush. The basic mitzvah of Kiddush is to verbalize with words that it's a special day and to say, in that small passage, you got it all. You have the word Shabbos, you have the word Kedusha, and you have Zecher Yitziat Mitzrayim. So this year, on Yom Kippur, Shechal Liyot B'Shabbos, everyone should have in mind that those words, I am fulfilling the mitzvah of Kiddush, and I think it's a good idea. All you can do is gain, and you can't lose. And on Yom Kippur, it doesn't hurt to have another mitzvah under your belt. I want to also remind everyone that at Ne'ila, if there is Kohanim, you should preferably duchin before Shkia. However, I never liked and I dislike, and I'm going to be very harsh, I don't like rushing Ne'ila. I really don't, for many, many reasons. And I think that since 
it's such a beautiful and important part of our Yom Kippur, it's a pity that we rush it for a good mitzvah, Birkas Kohanim, but you're obviously losing the beauty of Ni'ila. My suggestion is that Ni'ila should therefore start at the first possible time. The first possible time that Ni'ila could start is Plag HaMincha. So you can look in the calendar, when is Plag HaMincha? That's the earliest time you can mekabel Shabbos on a Friday. That should be the starting time for Ni'ila. If not, I would not suggest to rush. I would suggest that if you omit a few of the slichot in the ila, you can make it up after HaMevarech et HaMo Yisrael Bashalom. There's no mitzvah to say Avinu Malkeinu line by line. At that point, if you omitted slichot in the Chazarat Hashatz, I think you could say it then. So that's my suggestion for Ni'ila. Definitely duchening before Shkia, but not at the expense of davening. And therefore, you should start davening early enough. You can't start Ni'ila before Plaga Mincha. So from Plaga Mincha on, and obviously, if you omit some of the Slichot, you could say it afterwards. There's plenty of time till Tzayta Kochavim. Okay. Now, Motzei Yom Kippur this year. Motzei Yom Kippur this year is a very different Avdallah than usual. And what I'm about to say is for Ashkenazim. In this booklet in Efrat, they basically paskin for Svardim. The Ashkenazic custom on Motzei Yom Kippur, Shechal Lihiyot B'Shabbos. Let's start with Besamim. Why do we smell Besamim every Motzei Shabbos? Anyone? Why do we smell Besam? The Neshama Yitera. The Neshama Yitera. Is there a Neshama Yitera on a day where we fasted all day? Big question. Some say yes, some say no. Bottom line, the Mishnah Brewer says that in his humble opinion, there is. And therefore, not only could you make the bracha on Besamim if you would like to, because it's not a bracha levatala, you're saying borei minei v'samim and you're enjoying it, you may have to. So therefore his preference is, and I quote, to say borei minei v'samim even if Yom Kippur is Shabbos. Okay? I can just quote his words to you when he comments on the Shulchan Aruch that says not to. Rabim meha'achronim cholkim alzeh. Most of the Achronim disagree, and he brings a whole list of them. Vesvurin, and they believe. Deshechal b'Shabbos, yesh levarech ala b'samim. And at the end of the day, he says, that's what you should do. So even though in the Machzer, it usually just says, borei mohorei ha'esh and amavdil, this year, I believe, if you're Ashkenazi, you should make the bracha on b'samim. What's the neshama yeteira? that you got, hopefully, mechilat avonot. God forgave all your sins on this holy day. That's a very good reason to talk about a neshama yeteira, not to mention that we stood the whole day with no food and no drink, basically just davening, which is an amazing achievement, and we want a little whiff of that before we leave it. Number two, the candle. On a normal Motzei Yom Kippur, how do you make avdala on a candle? The answer is you have to transfer fire because the reason that we make a bracha on a candle on Motzei Shabbos is because Adam HaRishon found out on his first Motzei Shabbos that if you rub two rocks together, there's fire. So to remember that amazing invention, that's what we do on Motzei Shabbos. Obviously, if it's Motzei Yom Kippur that comes out during the week, that is not the day that Adam HaRishon found fire. And therefore... We make a bracha on fire for a totally different reason. And that is that unlike every other Yom Tif, on Yom Kippur, it's usher to transfer fire. So from this perspective, we take a ner sheshavat, a candle that, so to speak, kept Shabbos. Namely, it was lit the whole time. We didn't light it throughout Yom Kippur. And we show a Kaddish Baruch Hu here. We kept this mitzvah and we're making now Havdalah. And we're going to get very close to it with our fingers, something we can't do on a regular Shabbos and Yom Kippur. What happens if Yom Kippur, therefore, 
comes out on Motzei Shabbos. So it is the anniversary of Adam HaRishon binding the buyer. On the other hand, there's a Motzei Yom Kippur procedure. The halacha is very simple. You should try to make Havdalah on a Ner Shabbat, namely on a Yortzeit candle that lit the entire Yom Kippur. Obviously, when you get Hanav from it, so you got to close the lights in the room, and you got to get close to it and obviously get hana by singing, seeing your fingertips. However, if on a normal Mozart Yom Kippur, if you didn't have this kind of candle, you would just omit that bracha. If it comes out Mozart Shabbos, if for some reason your yardside candle was blown out and you can't get another one, you don't have to go through a lot of trouble. You can just strike a match and make Avdallah on it. Even though, again, Lechatchila, try to do a Ner Shabbat. If you don't have it because it got blown out, you can use a regular match on a Motzei Shabbos. I can tell you last year, where I'm usually for Yom Kippur, they have a Yorzeit candle, and it got blown out. Last year it wasn't on a Motzei Shabbos. So they try to use, to get the pilot light in the oven to another candle. Each time they tried, it got blown out each time. So eventually I said, we're doing, it's not worth it. Let's just forego Boremo Reha Ish. If that happened this year, my solution would be simple. Use a match. So once again, Motze Yom Kippur, this year, I believe you should make the bracha on Besamim. And number two, regarding the Ner Shabbat, if you have it, use it. And if not, you can use, in my opinion, a regular candle this year. That happens to be all the special halachot for this year. I thought 40 minutes or 42 minutes is very good. Before we go on to just general halachot that have to do with every year, um, very quickly, um, I just wanted to know if anyone has any questions. No. Nope. Not from nope. my side. Anyone else? You must be the most best teacher in the world. Then no, I'm joking. Mm -hmm. Actually, Can't pretty, uh, pretty clear and, and and very practical. Really appreciate it. Great I'm going to send uh, afterwards to our chat. I'll just send the uh, the notes to Rashi Prokim, so you don't have to remember everything I said. Um, I'll just add. Uh, I, I have notes beyond the Rashi Prokim while while you were speaking. Do you, do you want to see them first, or do you want me just to put it on the group? Oh, you can put it on the group. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Just, just maybe look at it in case something wasn't uh, transcribed correctly. Okay, no problem. No problem. So, uh, don't forget the, uh, for the Simanim, we want you to put in the chat. The Simanim I put in already. You did? I, I didn't see it. it. You didn't see it. Message, Chagi. You didn't see it. No. Okay. I'll send it out uh, on the regular Thank chat you. then. You for some reason, it didn't. Go, that's funny. How did that happen? I'm in the chat now. I just did chat. I don't know. Um, maybe you could ask it how many are chat. Yeah, no, I'll send it to you directly. It's fine. Okay, just a few uh general notes uh right before we adjourn. Uh again, because many people got this halakhot from uh, the Moatza and uh they may see it. It says to say the bracha Ladlik Nir Shel Shabbat for Yom Tov when it comes to uh Sukkis and Shemini yeah, Atzeret as well. Obviously not. Number two, on Friday of uh, Erev Yom Kippur, the bracha on candles is, of course, Ladlik Ner Shel Shabbat Ve Yom HaKippurim. If you say Shehechiyonu at that point when you light candles, you cannot go into a car. Shehechiyonu means you are Mekabel the Kedusha of Yom Tif, of Yom Kippur. So if you're planning to drive to shul, then you can light candles, but don't say shechianu. Save the shechianu for after kol nidre. Um, beyond that, just uh, another note. In this booklet, it said that you're not allowed to shave on cholam and it's a big iser, and uh, they brought the tshuva of Rav Moshe that basically says it's allowed, but only b'diyevet. I don't think it's a big secret to anyone here that Rav Soloveitchik, based on the Nodeh Be Yehuda and others, felt that not only can you shave on Chalom 
You have to shave on Cholamoid. The reason you have to shave on Cholamoid is because it's Lechavod Yantiv. You look like a shlump. So therefore, um, I don't want anyone to feel guilty if they're shaving on Cholamoid. It could very well be, as I like to say to people, shaving on Cholamoid is either Aser or Achiyuv. There's no in between. Next, benching lulav. In this booklet of Efrat, it said the Mahadrin bench lulav at home in the sukkah before they come to shul. You should know that that's a hider according to Tosvot. According to the Rambam, it actually defrays from the mitzvah. It's a long story why. Suffice it to say, according to the Rambam, the most preferable way to bench lulav is right before halal. So whoever does that should not feel they're not doing something mahadrin. They're doing something lechatchila should be lechatchila. However, there's a different opinion, but it doesn't mean that what you're doing is in any which way usher or not preferable. Finally, if you have a sukkah, and in the sukkah you have an overhang of pasal schach, say you have your air conditioning unit that's part of that's on part of the sukkah on the side, not in the middle, but on the side, then everybody here knows there's a famous halacha of dofen akuma. Dofen akuma means as if the wall goes ahead and slants and goes right to under the schach. If you don't have four amot, that could happen. In the booklet of Ephrat, it says you're not supposed to sleep under that overhang. The halacha is you can sleep under that overhang, if it's on the sides of the sukkah, not in the middle, but if it's on the sides of the sukkah. So that's just a few corrections to this booklet that we all got. Finally, I just want to Wait, end. Why, why, why can you sleep on the, uh, under the because overhang? I thought, I thought that's considered like hustle part of the sukkah. That part, again, if it's in the middle of the sukkah is a very big problem. If it's on the sides, then we consider the wall of the sukkah as if it slants. So you're sleeping under a slanted wall. You're not sleeping under the puzzle's schach. That's the halacha as paskind in the Shulchan Aruch. It's as if you're sleeping under the schach because the wall slanted. And Picture what about you? As if you're in a car and the car has a sunroof and there isn't four amo to any side and you put schach on top of the sunroof, then you can sleep in the car normally. You don't have to sleep in the car only under the schach. It's a nice chumrah, but again, you shouldn't have to think. You have to look for another sukkah if that happens. And what about eating? Eating and sleeping should be the same. Eating and sleeping are the same. I mentioned sleeping, but it's eating okay. is the same. Eating is the same. So from this perspective, um, that's with regard to pasal schach. If it's a space in the schach, namely more than a lavud, more than 24 centimeters, then you're not allowed to eat or sleep under it. So open space is worse than puzzles schach. That's the rule of the thumb, just to remember it. Okay, one last word about this year's Yomim Tovim. I think all of us feel that this year's Yomim Tovim cannot be celebrated as we always have in the past few years. All of us feel that not only was our Simchas Torah curtailed exactly a year ago today, but rather all of our Yomim Tovim ever since have not been the same. And I don't think they should be the same. There's still soldiers fighting. There's a war going on. There's still hostages. There's many wounded. We're far, far from a normative situation. And therefore, I'd like to encourage everyone to obviously not feel guilty if those two feelings come at the same time. On the one hand, it's Yontiv and the Yom Im Tovim in general, and it's a beautiful time. And unlike last year, it doesn't come out on Shabbos. So we have a Yontiv and a Shabbos and a Yontiv and a Shabbos. Wonderful for all of us to have so many days of Kedusha. But on the other hand, there's still a war going on. I'll send in the chat afterwards one of the many suggestions of how to incorporate that into our davening. But it's just one of many suggestions. I just want to say that no yontiv in our calendar has ever been perfect. On Pesach, thank God we got out of Mitzrayim, but just a few days later, the Mitzrayim almost killed us 
at the banks of the Sea of Reeds of Yamsuf. On Shvi Shel Pesach, we had a big miracle and the Egyptians were no more. And just a few days later, we had problems of eating and of drinking when we got to Mara. We finally got the Torah on Shavuos, and just a few weeks later was the Chaita Egel. Baruch Hashem, the Sukkah, remembers the beautiful 40 years in the desert where God looked after us. But at the same time, I don't have to go through the list of all the Chataim that we went through in the desert. In other words, no Yom Tiv is totally perfect. And just like in davening, we yearn for the Beis Hamikdash because there's a whole chunk of our Yom Tiv celebration that we're not fulfilling. No Ali Allah Regal, no Korbanot. I believe that this year it's totally legitimate and as a matter of fact preferable to obviously mention what we're missing even within Shul, even within davening, and of course at our Shabbos and Yontif tables. No one should feel that Yontif and Shabbos are off limits. Hafuch. These are days of Din. These are days of absolute justice from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's exactly the days to mention all our most innermost Bakashot that we need for the new year. So Be'ezrat Hashem, I hope and pray that things should only get better and not worse. But if they do not, we should definitely daven that things get better and do everything we can beyond davening to make sure that this year will be 10 times better than last year. On that note, wishing Amen. everyone a Shana Tova, a Ktiva V'chatima Tova, Lanu L'chol Yisrael, B'chol Makom Shehem, and a Mirza Hashem, we should be Zochet to a much better year, as we like to say and we should say, Dichle Shana V'kile Amen. Thank you very much. Amen. Thank, Thank you so you much. much. Oh, I mean, beautiful. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Everyone should have a good night. Take sure. care. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Should a woman say Shekhyan on Erev Yom Kippur when she lights candles and then again at Shul? No, absolutely not. A woman should not say Shekhyanu twice. Shekhyanu is only said once per customer. So the Erev Yom Kippur, if you say it by candles, you do not say it afterwards when you go ahead and you and the people are saying it in Shul. If obviously you didn't say it by candles, you say it in Shul. What was the space for? It's three tefachim open space, right? That's that ruins the circle. That part. How much are you saying that three tefachim is? Three tefachim uh, lechumra because it's uh, the orisa is twenty four centimeters. Okay. In general, a sukkah should be three walls schach with no spaces of that nature. However. In a sukkah specifically, we utilize all the, I hate to use the term, but I will, the tricks mm -hmm. in the book. Halacha l'moshem isinais, of lavud, of gudasik, of dolphin akuma. And therefore, many sukkahs that when you look at it, you say, how can this sukkah be kosher, may very well be kosher. However, there are certain things that make a, a sukkah unkosher, and they're not uncommon. And one of them is open space. So open space could really invalidate a sukkah, especially if it's in the middle. And therefore, you should be careful to try to cover your roof properly without those spaces. Yeah, it's the bane of my existence. The what? The bane of my existence. It's, <laughs> uh, you know, the open spaces. The other things, you know, it's hard to ruin exactly. Worst comes to worst, you have a little dope for Nakuma, but the open space is uh, a problem. Again, up to 24 centimeters, you're good. And uh, there's no problem whatsoever. And uh, I, it's rare to see a sukkah like that in people's homes. I admit that when you go out to eat on sukkahs, you should be very careful to check the sukkah. I uh, have seen sukkahs. They're made as an afterthought, not made as the main McCoy. And therefore, I can just tell you honestly, I asked the mashkiach in a restaurant, did he look after the sukkah? And he says, no, my job is just the food. And I found that to be terrible to hear. You know, you're a Tamad Chacham, obviously. You know what you're doing. So fix the sukkah. It wasn't so hard. But he says, like a bureaucrat, no, sukkah's not my business, only the food. So people were eating in a puzzle sukkah, literally with spaces everywhere, in the middle, on the sides. 
all more than 24 centimeters. So up to 30 you can be mekel, because that's the shira chazonish, but it really didn't help. So you should definitely check sukkahs when you go out to eat. At home, I'm pretty sure most sukkahs are done kehil chata. It's very hard to find a sukkah that was totally puzzled. But once, it did happen to me. I mean, when you eat outside, when you eat out, if the mashkiach is not taken responsible, for all you know, they put the schach on first, right? I mean, uh, if it's still right, uh, the question is, do you need it to know that it's good or just to look and it's uh, you don't see a problem? No, I don't think you need to check beyond looking at it. If it looks kosher, then you can assume that it was done properly. Oh, I don't think you have to check to the extent that you have to ask, what you just brought up, did the schach go on first before the walls? I don't think you have to go to that extent. If it looks kosher, you probably could assume it's kosher. However, if you see a sukkah that looks questionable, then definitely the question should come up. Good. Many things that uh, we obviously are makbid in a sukkah, um, such as what you mentioned, and it should be something we're makbid on, like putting on the schach only after the walls, does not necessarily invalidate a sukkah if it was done post facto. So I'm not sure you have to really check out Kedekach. Having said that, when you go out to eat, when you go to restaurants or attractions on Cholomoid, if you can get through the traffic, I believe you should check the sukkah in terms of just looking at it and making sure that there's three walls and schach. Good. If you already brought it up, I can tell you that uh, I once went into a sukkah that was a beautiful sukkah and there was no open spaces, Bensi, but there was a garbage pail in there. You're not allowed to put a garbage uh, pail in your sukkah. Right. It's learned in the Gemara from a dirty pot. So, uh, I very nicely said you should take the garbage pail outside and the owner of the restaurant refused. So I said to him, and he had a keep on. And I said to him, you know, on Shmini Atzeret, you're not allowed to eat in the sukkah. It's about Tosef de Rabbanon, to eat in the sukkah on Shmini Atzeret. But if you need to, one of the ways is to invalidate your sukkah. And what's the best way to invalidate your sukkah? Put Easy, garbage. put a garbage <laughs> pail in there. So that convinced him. Right. <laughs> Good. Good, thank you. All right, so I'll put this on in a minute. Just, uh, you know, if you have a chance, sure. in case there's an error. because I just No problem. So I won't have to put it on. Great. All right, good. Thank Take you very much. Take care, everyone. Shana Tovah.